Uh, welcome back. So in this video, we're going to transition back from uh, first-order uh, systems of differential equations to second-order systems. And um, this will feel sort of like what we did earlier in the course when we went from first-order differential equations to second-order differential equations. And specifically in section 5.4 of Edwards and Penny, we are going to study um, mass spring systems consisting of more than one mass and spring. And um, the treatment will sort of be analogous to what we did in Chapter 3 when we did single mass uh, spring systems, um, uh, except now we're dealing with more masses and springs, and there'll be a lot of vector and matrix replacements for things we did with scalars before. All right, so here is a warm-up exercise. By now, everybody, uh, I believe, is expert at finding eigendata for matrices. This is a matrix we're going to use later in this video. And uh, in particular, we're going to use a multiple of the matrix A, which is minus 2, 1, 1 minus 2. And um, this exercise will help us remember that when we multiply a matrix, we keep the eigenvectors, but we just multiply the eigenvalues. Okay, so you could try it now, or um, I'll just go ahead and do it now. So for part A, uh, we're going to compute the characteristic polynomial, a the determinant of A minus lambda i, And uh, when we take the product of the diagonal terms, we get uh, lambda squared. We'll also get our lambdas, which is 2 lambda plus 2 lambda, so that's plus 4 lambda. And then the constant term is the 4 from the diagonal product minus the 1, so that's plus 3. So this is uh, lambda plus 1 times lambda plus 3. So the roots, the eigenvalues, are lambda is minus 1 and minus 3. Okay, so for A, the lambda equals minus 1 eigenspace is the null space of A minus minus 1 I which is the null space of the matrix. I'm just plugging in lambda equals minus 1 into the expression up here, as you know. So this is uh, minus 1, 1, 1, minus 1. And I, for the null space, I want that matrix times V is 0. And so uh, the vector 1, 1 is an eigenvector, and this is a one-dimensional eigenspace. So it is spanned by the vector 1, 1, because 1 times the first column plus 1 times the second column is 0. And the eigenspace for lambda equals minus 3 is the null space for a minus lambda i minus 2 plus 3 is 1, 1, 1, minus 2 plus 3 is 1, 0, 0. 1 minus 1 is an eigenvector because 1 times the first column minus 1 times the second is 0. Okay, and now for C times A, uh, well, C A times a vector V is C times A V. <laughs> oh, that's not saying much. But so if A V is lambda V, then the 
then uh, CA times V will be C times AV, which is C times lambda V. So when we multiply, and we've seen this before, but it's a very important point, if you multiply A by the scalar C, eigenvectors stay the same, but the eigenvalues get multiplied by C. So for CA, the matrix CA, we have an eigenspace where lambda, instead of being minus 1, is minus C, and it's spanned by the same eigenvector as the minus 1 space was spanned by, and we have an eigenspace where lambda is minus 3 times C, and it's spanned by the vector, which was the eigenvector for A when lambda was minus 3, which is 1 minus 1. Okay. We'll see in a lot of examples that working with scaled matrix um, matrices simplifies computations. All right. So the kind of configurations we study in section 5.4 are coupled systems of masses and springs, and we're studying the motion uh, in the direction of the configuration. Sometimes that's called a longitudinal motion as opposed to transverse oscillation. And actually, uh, we'll say a few words and have a video demo of transverse oscillations. In uh, the next video. Transverse oscilla oscillations are perpendicular to the direction of the configuration. Okay, so we've um, previously uh, derived the system of second-order differential equations for this configuration here um, using Newton's second law that the mass times the acceleration uh, of any one of these masses is the net forces. Um, as compared to equilibrium. So um, let's remember where we got that system and the natural initial value problem. Let's just look at the first equation for x1. Um, so uh, on the left, we just have the mass times the acceleration of x1. And the diagram indicates that we are measuring the displacements from where the first mass would be if the system was at rest in equilibrium. So uh, the x1 term here on the right that's the additional stretch or compression, if x1 was negative, of the first spring from equilibrium. And in the linearized model, we assume the force, the extra force uh, from the spring as compared to at equilibrium is just proportional to that stretch amount and the minus sign 
the minus k1, uh, the minus sign is because uh, the extra stretch, the, the stretch um, causes a force in the opposite direction. So if x1 is positive, the first spring is stretched an extra amount, so the force will be in the negative direction because uh, the force acts in opposite in opposition to the displacement okay and in the second term the k2 is the spring constant for the second spring the x2 minus x1 is the stretch or compression uh, of the second spring from equilibrium. So that's the extra stretch or compression of spring two. From equilibrium, for example, if x2 equaled x1, then uh, the middle spring is not, uh, each mass is displaced exactly the equal amount, so the uh, middle spring is not getting any extra stretch or compression. And if x2 was bigger than x1, the spring is getting stretched. And it's plus k2 for the first spring. Plus k2, because if the second spring... I mean for the first mass, if the second spring is stretched, that will cause a positive acceleration on the first mass, basically because the spring is attached on the positive side because stretching, so it's plus K2 because stretching spring 2 accelerates M1 in the positive direction. Okay, we've derived this before, and it's similar for the Newton's law for the second mass. And then physically, it makes sense that for an initial value problem, we should get to specify the initial displacement and velocity of the first mass, as well as the initial displacement and velocity of the second mass. Okay. And so uh, that natural initial conditions that it has four parameters indicates that the dimension of the solution space is four. So intuitively, based on physics, we have four free parameters which uniquely specify the solution. There are the four initial conditions. And so uh, that's uh, one meaning of the word uh, dimension. It's how many free parameters it takes to uniquely specify an element in your vector space. Um, Typically, those are weights, dimension of solution space equals 4. Now, the precise reason the dimension is 4 has to go with how we've converted higher-order differential equations and systems to first-order ones. And so here, the way you would do that would be uh, you would introduce... Uh, well, you have x1, you would define v1, and I'm using v1 because it's velocity, to be x1 prime. You have x2, 
and you would define v2 to be x2 prime, and then x1 v1, x2 v2 prime, using the second order system, I'll be able to rewrite that in terms of uh, x1, v1, x2, and v2, and, and it's easy. So x1 prime, by definition, was v1. v1 prime was x1 double prime, so uh, that is um, x1 double prime is minus k1 over m1 x1. I'm using the first differential equation, plus k2 over m1 x2 minus x1. x2 prime is v2 by definition, and for a solution to the original system, v2 prime uh, is x2 double prime, and that's minus k2 over m2 x2 minus x1 minus k3 over m2 x2. And you'll notice that the initial conditions translate into an initial condition for the first order system. So I'll just uh, move my dividing line over. And x1 of 0, v1 of 0, x2 of 0, v2 of 0 is uh, a1, a2, b1, b2. So IVP1 is equivalent to IVP2, and we know that for first order homogeneous systems, the dimension of the solution space is exactly the number of functions. So we know for IVP2, the dimension of the solution space equals 4. All right, so that's actually the justification, the precise justification for the intuitive uh, computation of the dimension based on physics for the original system. So it, in both cases, the dimension is 4. And so uh, you could take a minute and guess what it is if we have um, a number other than two masses. Or I'll just tell you. So uh, if you have three masses and up to four springs, then um, you'll have a system of three second-order differential equations that will be equivalent to a system of six first-order differential equations. So the dimension of the solution space will be 6. Thinking in terms of physics, for each mass you get to specify an initial displacement from equilibrium and an initial velocity. That is 6 free parameters. So the dimension here of the solution space equals 6. And um, this train is really can be thought of as the first example where there's no masses, uh, no springs uh, the, in the first and third slots. But in any case, you, uh, the system here is equivalent to a system of four first order differential equations. And in general, if you have n masses, so an n mass. Uh, n plus 1 s 
spring configuration where some of those the springs on either end might be missing. The solution space is two n dimensional. Okay, so let's focus on the first example, and I've reproduced. Uh, what we got from Newton's second law, and it'll be convenient to write these systems in matrix vector form. So let's collect terms uh, in the first one. So the x1s, there's an x1 term in each piece, and the coefficients are minus k1 and minus k2, so that's minus the quantity k1 plus k2 x1 and then it's plus k2 x2 and in the second equation for the mass times the acceleration of the second mass we'll end up with a plus k2 x1 and then minus a quantity k2 plus k3 x2 and I should say you can uh, you can get these, equa uh, these equations with the right signs if you just think about what happens. I won't write anything down. I'll just talk this through. If, if you start from equilibrium and jiggle either x1 or x2 separately a little bit. So if you're looking at the first mass and you hold x2 fixed and you move x1 a little bit, you'll get a minus k1 you say, yeah, minus k1x1, um, and uh, you'll be comp if x1 was positive, you'll be compressing the second spring, so you'll get a minus k2x1. And um, then if you think of holding the first mass stationary and moving x2 a little bit, say x2 was made positive, then you would be stretching the second spring a little bit more from equilibrium and uh, since, you're, since that spring is attached on the positive side of the first mass you would get a plus K2X2. So that's an alternate way to check what the right uh, coefficients are. All right, well so if you look at the system as compared to the matrix you can see that if I make the vector of accelerations, x1 double prime, x2 double prime, and if I look at the first entry on the left of this system, I just get m1 x1 double prime, and the first entry on the right reproduces uh, the right-hand side of the first differential equation. And when I go to the second entries of the product on the left, I just get m2 x2 double prime, and uh, when I look at the second entry of the matrix times x1, x2 on the right, I get the second entries there. And we'll think of this, uh, this diagonal matrix of the masses as the mass matrix. We'll think of the vector of accelerations of each mass as the acceleration vector. And we'll think of this matrix made out of k's as a k matrix, and then uh, we have the vector x. So that's a shorter way to write the same system, and it would especially be shorter if we were dealing with three masses or four masses, etc. Okay, well, when you look at the original equations, you can solve for the accelerations by dividing the first one by m1 and the second one by m2 and then you would divide the right hand sides uh, as well and so you could bring uh, those divisions into the k matrix so the first row would be divided by m1 and the second row would be divided by m2 uh, in terms of matrix algebra, 
you can also think of this as multiplying the, the system on the left by um, the inverse of the mass matrix and the inverse of a diagonal matrix uh, with non-zero diagonal entries. It's just the matrix of reciprocals of the diagonal entries. All right, so now let's talk about finding a basis for the solution space of this homogeneous second-order system of differential equations. Remember, the, it's homogeneous because the linear operator is x double prime minus ax. That's the linear operator. And we're looking for um, the vector functions x, um, which give us 0 when we apply that operator. All right. Well, if we were thinking uh, first-order systems or scalar second-order differential equations, we might think of trying something like uh, e to the rt times a v as special solutions. Now, actually, the good student will say, well, come on, we've been converting everything into first-order systems. Why don't we do that? And then just proceed as we did uh, for first order systems. Well, actually, it turns out that would be harder because we'd end up getting complex eigendata. And by leaving it as a second order system, we're going we're gonna to be able to avoid complex eigendata. However, if we had damping, we would have to do this. But um, we're not actually going to consider the case of damping um, for these mass spring systems. The text d does, actually, in section um, 5.6, I think. Yeah, so what seems like a good idea is it turns out actually not. A good idea. So, uh, I mean, turning this into a first order system. Let's stick with the second order system and let's try e to the RTV as a special solution. So, uh, let's, so there's two possibilities. R could be real or uh, R could be complex. So if R was real, um, then we would just, if it would be, say, A, which is a real number, then we would get solutions e to the a t v. So hold that for a second. If r was complex, it would say a plus i omega, and we could uh, assume omega was positive by taking the right conjugate uh, root, then um, we get these complex solutions e to the a plus i omega t v, where v was a complex vector, and if that was a solution, then we would, just using linearity like we did before, we would write z of t in terms of its real vector function plus i times what we call the imaginary part, uh, x2 of t, which also would be real. And so we'd be expanding this. All right, now let's think about what would happen if A was not zero. Well, this is a conservative system because it's got no damping, so it could take some time, but we would be able to write down uh, the kinetic energy, which would be the sum of the kinetic energies from each mass, plus the potential energy, which would be the potential energies corresponding to how much each spring was being stretched uh, or compressed from its equilibrium length. 
And once the system was set in motion, that total energy function would have to be constant. So if we're thinking of the real case, e to the at v, well, if a was positive or negative, then either that solution is uh, growing exponentially or decaying exponentially, so there's no way its total energy uh, could stay constant, because if the solution is growing exponentially, uh, then so is its derivative, and the, the growing part would be affecting the potential energy would be growing, and the derivative part would be affecting the kinetic energy, and that would also be growing, so the energy would be going to infinity, the total energy, and if, if A was negative, the total energy would be going to zero. So uh, we can't have either positive or negative A. Now, um, what if uh, we had the complex case? Well, then it's really the same. You have these, these mixed exponential tr trig functions when you work out the real and the imaginary parts. And... Um, the displacements would be oscillating, but they would be having, uh, their amplitudes would be either growing or decaying exponentially. So the potential energy would be oscillating, but um, it would, the, the amplitude uh, would mean that at certain t values, the potential energy was getting super large. And similarly, when you looked at the derivatives, you'd have the, the same thing happening with the kinetic energies, and um, the oscillation would be happening in such a way so that uh, the Ke plus the Pe was supposed to be constant, but that, that can't happen because uh, even if the P, Pe, even if the Ke is zero, uh, there would be times when the Pe was going to infinity, and uh, both the Ke and the Pe are positive. All right, so the end of this argument is uh, if we look for a solution of the form E to the RT V, then the real part of R, A, has to be zero. That could be all of R, or if R is complex, it's just the real part. Whew. Okay, so... Instead of e to the a plus i omega t, we just have e to the i omega t times v. Okay, so now let's plug that in to, and that's just from conservation of energy. Those are the only exponential times a vector solutions we can get. So now let's plug those in. So if I compute z double prime, v is a constant vector, so I'll just get an uh, I omega from Z prime and another I omega factor when I take the second derivative. So uh, for Z double prime, I'll get I omega quantity squared times Z, which is minus omega squared e to the I omega TV. And A times Z is just A times e to the I omega T V e to the i omega t is just a scalar for any t, so I can factor it out. So this is a z of t. When I look at this, uh, e to the o i omega t is a common uh, non-zero factor. Its modulus is always 1 uh, for all t. So that this identity will hold if and only if the minus omega squared v equals the av. Okay, so what's that saying? That is saying that v is an eigenvector, but its eigenvalue is negative 
omega squared. All right, so its eigenvalue better be uh, less than or equal to zero because omega was a real number. Okay, and then furthermore, uh, because lambda is real, when we find the eigenspace, um, A minus lambda I is, is a real matrix, so we'll, we'll get real eigenvectors. So V, the eigenvector, can be chosen to be a real, a vector of real numbers. And then uh, when we expand E to the I omega T V using Euler's formula, um, we'll get cos omega T V plus I sine omega T V, where V is a real vector. So the real part of the solution will be cos omega T V. The imaginary part will be sine omega t v. These are independent real solutions. All right, and if we had used the conjugate eigenvalue and eigenvector, we would have ended up with an equivalent uh, two independent solutions, real solutions, when we were just looking at spans. All right, so that was a long discussion, but I wanted to do it precisely. The, the final upshot is that we don't need to use Euler's formula. We can just find all the eigenvalues of the acceleration matrix A, hope that they turn out to be non-positive real numbers, and we especially like negative real numbers for lambda, and then uh, lambda equals minus omega squared is saying that omega squared is minus lambda, and if lambda is negative or even non-positive, uh, minus lambda is greater than or equal to zero, and omega will be its square root. Okay, so um, this is completely analogous to what we did in Chapter 3 when we were considering um, undamped, unforced oscillators. We came to recognize that the positive coefficient, k over m, of x was omega naught squared, where the solutions were just uh, cos omega naught t and sine omega naught t. So that avoided... Uh, doing the characteristic uh, equation and converting e to the i omega naught t into the real and imaginary parts. All right, so here is the solution space algorithm. Um, we're considering systems of the form x double prime equals AX. If A is diagonalizable, and if all of its eigenvalues are negative, then for each eigenpair lambda j, vj, and this is, this is real eigenpairs, there will be two solutions, cosine omega j, t, v, and sine omega j, T, V, where the angular frequency omega j is the square root of negative lambda j. And um, in the case where all the eigenvalues were negative, we get two solutions per eigenvector, and because the matrix is diagonalizable, there are n independent eigenvectors, so altogether, we will get two n independent solutions, and that's how many we need if we have n masses. And the number of masses is uh, the size of x of t and um, the, the rows and columns of A. So, so we'll get a basis for this solution space. Now, what's amazing is that in our application to 
um, conserved mass spring systems, the acceleration matrix is always diagonalizable. It's actually related to the spectral theorem, which you might have talked about in um, linear algebra. And all of the eigenvalues of that acceleration matrix will be uh, non-positive. And if um, your masses and springs are glued on either end, so tethered or even just on one end to at least uh, one wall, then all of the eigenvalues are strictly negative and the algorithm will always give us a basis for the solution space for the mass spring system. If the system is not tethered, like this train here, then it will always turn out that uh, lambda equals zero is an eigenvalue for uh, the system, uh, for the matrix, for the acceleration matrix A, and the eigenvector is always just a vector of ones in every entry or a multiple of that vector. And we can see why, because for this train, Um, as long as uh, x2 minus x1 is 0. In other words, the displacement of the second mass from equilibrium equals the displacement of the first mass from equilibrium, then you're not stretching the spring from equilibrium. And in trains, they actually are connected by springs. They're just super stiff springs, like on cars. Um, OK, so you're not stretching the spring from equilibrium length. So no. Um, net forces are added. The net forces were zero at rest. Um, so um, uh, no acceleration of either mass. So um, uh, x double prime equals ax will be 0. OK, now what did that have to do with these solutions? Well, if uh, x1 of t, x2 of t equals c1 plus c2 t times 1, 1. In other words, x1 and x2 are each c1 plus c2, then x2 minus x1 does identically equal 0. Notice that x double prime equals 0. So uh, um, so ax, well, and ax equals 0 as well, because there's um, no accelerating going on. So we have solutions. And these are super easy to understand. This is the C1 means that instead of um, starting our train from what we had marked as the original equilibrium solutions, we just 
picked up the whole configuration without stretching the spring and moved everything over by a distance c. And the c2 is just the velocity of each car as it's moving down the track. Okay, let us go back to the tethered case. We'll come back to the untethered train at, at, in example three. All right, so if you look at the, con the modeling we did on page one, and if both m's are equal, and if all the springs have the same spring constant, then the system reduces to this system, which is k over m times the matrix we studied in the warm-up exercise. And that matrix had eigenvalues minus 1 and minus 3 and corresponding eigenvectors 1, 1, and minus 1, 1. All right, so now see if you can write down the general solution to this system of two second-order differential equations. I'll do it if you don't want to try, but uh, if you could have done it, then you've understood everything up until now. Okay, so um, for our A, which is K over M, times minus 2, 1, 1, minus 2. The eigenvalues are multiplied by K over M, so we now have an eigenvalue of minus K over M instead of minus 1. And the eigenvector is the same. 1, 1. And um, instead of an eigenvalue of minus 3, we now have an eigenvalue of minus 3 k over m. And the eigenvector, or an eigenvector, is minus 1, 1, or 1 minus 1. Oh, I like 1 minus 1. Remember, scalar multiples of eigenvectors are still eigenvectors because eigenspace is a subspace. All right, well, that's the eigenvalues. The sinusoidal functions have angular frequencies, which are, so I'll call these lambda 1 and lambda 2, the square root of the opposite of the negative eigenvalues, so omega 1 is the square root of k over m, omega 2 is the square root of 3k over m, which is root 3 times omega 1, and then our four-dimensional solution space or the displacements of the first and the second mass from equilibrium are. Each eigenspace gives us two solutions. C1, I'll, I'll put the scalar functions that multiply the eigenvectors in front. C1 cos omega 1t plus C2 sine omega 1t times 1, 1 plus c3 cosine omega 2t plus c4 sine omega 2t times 1 minus 1. Now uh, we know that we can take linear combinations of cos omega t and sine omega t and put them in amplitude phase form. So we could also think of this 
as capital C1 cosine omega 1 t minus alpha 1. And we could consider the second coefficient as some amplitude C2 cosine of omega 2 t minus alpha 2. All right, now let's interpret what this means physically. So remember, x1 of t is displacement of the first mass from equilibrium. And x2 of t is the displacement of the second mass from equilibrium. If we happen to set this system in motion so that the C3 and the C4 were zero, we would get what's called the first normal mode of oscillation. And you'll notice that x1 of t always equals x2 of t. So that means that our masses are moving totally in harmony with each other. They're moving exactly the same. Um, in general, if um, the x1 of t and x2 of t um, are always... Uh, um, positive multiples of each other, then that's called in-phase oscillation. So this is uh, in-phase, so that means uh, x1 and x2 are always positive multiples of each other. So when yeah, and actually uh, equal amplitude because of the vector 1, 1. And the amplitude is just depending on the, the positive constant, uh, cap, capital C1. And physically, what's interesting is this is the slow mode. because the omega-1 is uh, root k over m, in contrast with the omega-2 angular frequency, which was root 3 times bigger. So I won't write everything down for the second mode. Um, if the little c1 and c2 were 0, you would just get this uh, normal mode, where this is out of phase. So Sometimes these are called normal modes or fundamental modes is a synonym. This one is out of phase and fast, faster than, than mode 1, right? Because x1 and x2 are always opposites of each other or more generally, they have opposite signs. This always happens if you have two mass, three spring configurations. Even if the masses aren't the same and the springs aren't the same, there'll always be a slow in-phase oscillation and a faster out-of-phase oscillation. And the general solution, I should say, is a superposition of these two so each normal mode has easy to see and visualize behavior. The general solution is a superposition, in other words, a linear combination of these two um, special solutions. And in general, uh, it'll look herky-jerky. It's not even going to be periodic because the angular frequencies are not related by rational multiples. It looks herky-jerky. It's not periodic. Mm. 
Okay. Uh, so there's a nice video which shows, um, which demonstrates this. So it will show you uh, the slow in phase mode. So the two masses are equal, the three spring constants are equal. So the masses are happily moving like good dance partners. <laughs> and then there's the fast out of phase mode where they're always going in opposing directions. And then there's the general superposition. Now it's just an animation, it's not a real experiment. And if I had access to the basement of physics, I would go get uh, an experiment from Adam Beeler and we would have run it and actually timed it and compared our predictions uh, to reality. All right, so um, on, on this next page, I just reproduced what we did on the uh, previous page. This was the in phase, out of phase. And um, you can skip through this section if you want, but I'm going to just check that actually with those four free parameters, C1 up to C4, we can uniquely solve every initial value problem, which is why the solution space is four-dimensional. So let's just, I won't rewrite anything, let's just see what the equations are that we get when we try to solve the initial value problem using the homogeneous solution. So x1 of 0 is supposed to be 0. When I look at the first entries in xh of t, at t equals 0, I'll get a c1, because cos of 0 is 0. The c2 won't show up, because sine of 0 is 0. And when I look at the second term, I'll just get a c3. That's supposed to equal a1, which is given. x2 of 0 is, that's the second entry in xh of t. So I will get a, a c1, but then I'll get a minus c3 when I look at the second entry of the second term. That's supposed to be uh, B1. And uh, that's just two equations and two unknowns for C1 and C3. And A3. And in fact, if you uh, subtract the equations and divide by 2, you'll see that C1 is a1 minus b1 over 2. And if you add the equations, sorry, if you add the equations and divide by 2, you'll see that c1 is a1 plus b1 over 2. And if you subtract them and divide by 2, you'll see that c3 is a1 minus b1 over 2. And similarly, when you uh, match the derivatives, x1 prime of 0 is, well then, uh, when you take derivatives of the coefficient function of 1, 1 and plug in t equals 0, you only get a contribution that contains c2, and it will be c2 omega 1. And when you do the same thing with the second uh, term, 
you will get C4 omega 2. That's supposed to equal A2. And when you do x2 prime of 0, uh, you will get C2 omega 1 minus C4 omega 2. And that's supposed to equal B2. And so it's, uh, it's easy just to save time. I won't do it. But you solve for C2 and C4. Okay, so to summarize this example, we found the general solution space. Um, we checked that we can uniquely solve every initial value problem using those four independent solutions. All right, and this video link is posted on our public page and on Canvas. It just takes a minute or two to watch. I recommend it. All right, now let's come back to the untethered case. And um, this relates very much to a couple of your Section 5.4 homework problems. In fact, it may be doing uh, part of them for you. All right, so um, this case is just the same as if we had two springs on either end and this was attached to a wall except those springs had spring constant zero. But let's just quickly derive the differential, the system of differential equations. Okay, so mass times the acceleration of the first mass. No drag. The only force is from that spring. The spring constant is K. The additional stretch or compression amount is X2 minus X1. It's a plus K because if that spring is stretched, it will be accelerating the first mass in the positive direction. M2, X2 double prime, is, well, if that spring is stretched to positive amount, it will be accelerating the second mass in the negative direction, because it's attached on the negative side. So we get minus K, X2 minus X1. All right, so if you can divide the first equation by m1, you will get minus k over m1 x1 plus k over m2 x2. And x2 double prime is k over m2 x1 minus k over m2 x2 in matrix vector form. The vector of accelerations is the acceleration matrix I'm reading off from the right. Oh, everything is K. And I can pull on this, so that's times the vector of displacements from equilibrium. This matrix, the acceleration matrix, I can pull a factor of k out. Okay, <laughs> so for this matrix, I'll call it B. K 
characteristic polynomial is uh, minus 1 over m1 minus lambda, 1 over m2, 1 over m2, minus 1 over m2, minus lambda. That is lambda squared from the diagonal product. The lambda terms, again from the diagonal, are plus... 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2 lambda and the constant terms cancel because I get a 1 over m1 m2 from the diagonal and a minus 1 over m, m, m1 m2 from the off diagonal Okay, so 0 is one of our eigenvalues, as advertised. The other one is going to be the opposite of 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2. So the eigenvalues uh, for the B matrix are... 0 and minus 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2. The eigenspaces and actually uh, let's let's save writing and and call and the text does this too in the homework, call that matrix of reciprocals as uh, minus C1, C2. Oh, this was M1. It's minus C1, C1, and C2 minus C2. Okay, so for lambda equals 0... Uh, 1, 1 is an eigenvector, because 1 times the first column plus 1 times the second column is 0. And so the eigenspace is the span of 1, 1. For lambda equals, um, let's see, C1 was on, so that's minus C1 plus C2. Then um, I'm using the upper matrix, so I will get, uh, when I subtract negative C1 plus C2, I add C1 plus C2, so I'll get C2, C1, C2, C1. And the eigenvector I can take is uh, C1 minus C2. All right, so that was for the B matrix. For the A matrix, which was K times the this capital C matrix made out of the little c's, the eigenvalues get multiplied by uh, k, um, but 0 times k is 0, so this will still be true. 1, 1 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue 0. For the eigenvalue, which is minus k times c1 plus c2, which is minus k times 1 over m1 
plus 1 over m2 t eigenvector c1 minus c2 is minus 1 over m1 sorry, is 1 over m1 minus 1 over m2 Okay, and now here is what our train is going to do. I think I can squeeze it on this page. Remember, this train looks like so. As we discussed, when lambda equals zero, the corresponding solutions are C1 plus C2 T times the vector 1, 1. And that is just the train going choo-choo down the track. Uh, with no oscillations. So that's from the lambda equals zero eigenspace. And then we get uh, the cosine, I'll call it uh, omega 2t, and there's a c1 and a c2, sorry, a c3. cosine omega 2t plus a c4 sine omega 2t times the eigenvector 1 over m1 minus 1 over m2. This is out of phase, so the cars are oscillating against each other. The omega 2 is the square root of the opposite of lambda, so that's the square root of k times 1 over m1 plus 1 over m2. That's the angular frequency of oscillation. This is uh, the fast out of phase oscillation. Also notice it makes sense because if in terms of the relative uh, masses, if M1 is bigger than M2, then 1 over M1, which is the relative amplitude of the first mass oscillation, is less than 1 over M2, right? So the heavier car is not going to be oscillating as much as the lighter car. And um, this one, the first one made sense too. This, our slow oscillation kind of turned into no oscillation at all as we evaporated the tethered situation with the springs on the left of M1 uh, and on the right of M2. So that became super slow in phase. It's not even oscillating anymore. And it makes sense in terms of the train. All right, so we talked about a lot today. Let's summarize what we did. Well, we generalized, the main point is that we generalized simple harmonic motion for a single mass and how did we 
And there, we just had a single, we had one natural angular frequency, which uh, for the mass spring configuration was root k over m2. We generalized that to uh, n fundamental modes. In our example, it was just two of... Um, uh, fundamental modes of oscillation um, with masses in phase or out of phase with respect to other masses. Um, um, using eigendata of the acceleration matrix. In chapter three, the solution space was two-dimensional. If we have in masses, the solution space is 2n dimensional, if we have n masses, and we'll have, uh, each fundamental mode will give us two solutions from the cos omega t and the sine omega t terms. All right. And then uh, the general solution is a superposition of uh, these nice normal mode oscillations. but it can look uh, quite messy, as you'll see from the video. It looks sort of herky-jerky and random. Okay, so that's what we talked about today.